located in Richardson, Texas, called Zygex. So they now sell this sort of manipulator for other applications to the semiconductor industry, for example, for probing labels and so on. But at the time, it was quite revolutionary. And actually, as far as I'm aware, it was the first time someone could put such a complex four degree of freedom device into an electron microscope. And since then, as you're well aware, uh, managed devices such as you know, Bajian's talk yesterday, Professor Hock at Penn State is very sophisticated, managed devices that even can be inside of a transitional microscope. So let me first introduce this uh, tool to you. And this was built uh, in collaboration with Mark Dyer, who was a sort of genius instrumentation guy who's now in Silicon Valley, and then colleagues from uh, uh, Washington University, where I was at the time in the Department of Physics, and Zybex Corporation in Texas. So this device uh, had four degrees of freedom. It had piezo motors mounted so that they could move an X and a Y stage. And separately, we had piezo motors that were uh, mounted to be able to move a Z stage up and down, and what we called the theta stage, which was capable of not a very large number of small steps in one 360-degree revolution. So this tool, um, in our hands, was used to pick up nanostructures by mounting AFM piano levers or STM probes on the opposing platforms and then manipulating those through voltages applied from the piezo tubes to position um, the opposing tips. So uh, as an example, uh, we uh, later published a paper in science that I'll come to momentarily, where we developed a protocol for moving an AFM cantilever tip using those sorts of controlling stages to contact nanotubes that might be, maybe you know, that funny tip, projecting off a ledge. And so we would typically deposit nanotubes on the sodium wafer and break it, and we'd have some projecting off the edge, and then we would approach with the AFM cantilever tip. And you might wonder about the boundary conditions. How did we actually glue the multi-wall part of the nanotubes that we were studying to the tip? We used a technique called electron beam induced decomposition on EBIT. And EBIT is actually a pernicious problem when you're doing electron microscopy in terms of imaging. If you don't have a UHV, SEM, and most people don't, then typically what can happen is you're rasping the electron beam over to generate uh, an image over the sample. You actually are generating secondary electrons. So let's suppose the instant beam is 30 kEV, 30 kilo electrons. That's pretty high kinetic energy for intersecting something like a hydrocarbon molecule stuck on the surface of moving chemistry. But when those electrons hit, for example, a silicon wafer, they can go about a micron or two into the surface and generate a cascade of secondary electrons, some of which escape. And those secondary electrons are just a few electron volts of kinetic energy. And they have a very high cross-section for breaking uh, bonds and example, hydrocarbons. So one technique we would use is to deliberately deposit a small amount of paraffin wax a, a little distance away from where we expected to make our EBIT clamps. And the paraffin at room temperature would actually surface diffuse the molecule so that there would be a steady supply of a feedstock that would be useful for making the EBIT clamps. Another thing we did literally was just rub the surface with our finger and have a little bit of grease there. Now, surface decomposition occurs from these secondary electrons. It also will happen in the assays for hydrocarbons that are just a little bit above the surface. And they can also participate in making this clamp. So the strategy would be to raster just over a small region, such as a small rectangular region, maybe 50 nanometers by 50 nanometers, for example, and build up this amorphous carbon in a separate paper that I won't go over today, which is on my website, we evaluated the mechanics of the EBIT deposit in and of itself using AFM. So that may be of interest to you. So 
in this paper, we were sort of developing our techniques and mounting attitudes across the opposing tips and moving the tips with respect to each other in space. <coughs> and uh, we could actually break some of the tubes, but the art that we're going to talk about in a moment is much clearer in terms of the images. We could um, cause buckling in the tubes. If you look very closely here, this is actually a tube that has a large number of ripples in it. And uh, that's a consequence of compressing to, to drive buckle formation. Uh, we made electrical measurements. Uh, sometimes we saw rectifying behavior. Sometimes we saw kind of interesting uh, behavior that indicated that the tubes were semi conducting and so on. So, with that tool on hand and such experience, we then set out to make measurements on multiple carbon nanotubes. And this developed into, for me, a sort of a saga because I thought I was finished more or less in 2000, or that we perhaps would publish more on the topic with uh, improved experimental manipulation. But it turned out that we got our tubes from Rick Smalley's group, and particularly from senior postdoc or super postdoc Andy Rinsler. And Andy was extremely busy because Rick at the time with Gary was sort of chasing the Nobel Prize. And he had two super postdocs that helped him win the Nobel Prize. They were very talented and they were working really hard. <coughs> so Andy said, I can send you nice multi-wall carbon nanotubes because multi-wall carbon nanotubes we had were not working very well because there was a lot of amorphous carbon and polyhedral carbon particles that were essentially in the way and making it very difficult to find individual multiple carbon nanotubes that could be approached with the tip and contacted and EBIT clamped and so on. So without our actually realizing it, uh, which uh, experimentalists should know, but somehow we didn't, Andy had actually done a particular type of oxidative cleanup that they had developed in the Somali group but not really advertised that broadly. And uh, that involved exposure to carbon dioxide and elevated temperatures such as around 7 or 800 degrees Celsius. And about 90% of the carbon was thus oxidized away. And the remainder would be quite clean in that is if you're looking with a scanning electron microscope or perhaps with a light microscope tubes. So the polyhedral particles and the amorphous carbon were more reactive and they were digested and removed through that oxidative <coughs> treatment. Now this will be very important later when we look at our data because some of this kind of puzzle. And we were very puzzled when we when we did this work, we wondered whether there was slippage of the clamps, but we eliminated that to a fair degree. <coughs> that could be possible, of course, as we make this sort of EBIT clamp for the positive material and slippage could occur during the pencil loading. But we felt it was not occurring. We carefully measured for some of our Nanotubes, the length that was projecting along the AFM cantilever sidewall uh, before and after the break, the length would be the same, and so it seemed like that sort of slipping had occurred. So I'm going to show you some modulus values that are puzzlingly low, as low as about 300 GPA. And then it was a theoretician at Northwestern University, Stephen Milkey, a postdoc of George Schatz, who also was working with. Lichko, who decided there had to be a reason for these strength values not being 130 GPA. I'll show you a range of strengths that are lower than, one, than the ideal limit, such as we talked about for graphene, around 130 degrees let's go. And modulus values that were not 1,100 GPA, but sometimes as low as 300. So we made measurements on 19 different multiple carbon nanotubes. I had an extremely talented graduate student who's now a tenured professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana in mechanical sciences. So you can see that we had tensile strengths ranging from 11 to 63, and Young's modulus values ranging from 270 to 950. So in this experiment, as I explained, we're making a clamp with this EBIT method, and we have opposing AFM cantilever tips so this is actually the EBIT deposit right here projecting off of the silicon nitride tip that was used. In 
in the experiment, what we're doing is we're driving uh, piezo displacement uh, of one of the cantilevers, and for example, the upper cantilever. And we know where this position is. And so the force is simply the stiffness constant of this cantilever measured by its displacement. I think you can see some limitations of this technique as well. It's sort of like using a fishing pole. And as a consequence of uh, using these slender and long AFM cantilevers that had stiffness constants in the right range for the outer shell uh, uh, stiffness and strength to be able to measure good displacements at the experimental image resolution of SDM. So the pixelation of your image is a challenge in terms of the error of your measurement of D. <clears throat> so we had to, by trial and error, choose the right sort of cantilever <coughs> for relatively large displacement, but not be too soft that it would enormously displace. And you don't really have perfect tensile loading here, or pure tensile loading. There's clearly some potential torque and bending moment present as well. So the first puzzling thing that happened for us was our ability to measure strain in terms of that pixelation versus stress had slopes for the curves which were not perfectly straight lines for one thing, and also uh, were typically low values such as this value of 274 GPA. Can I ask Let me now switch to a related topic. Uh, we 
did the same sort of experiment, but now with single low carbon nanotubes, where due to the nature of what we were capable of at the time, we picked up bundles of single low carbon nanotubes. So I'll present the model that we used in which we believe from the data set that we were actually loading the tubes on the periphery of the bundle, not the ones in the center, again through the EBIT deposition. So what we do here is we tear the single wall carbon nanotube material. And that tearing operation will leave some bundles projecting up that we can try to contact EBIT mount and then tease out of this sort of yarn material. And again, we're configuring the experiment to be able to uh, apply a load and measure displacement with an AFM candle. And when we did so, uh, we ended up conjecturing that this sort of model was sensible, where, and you can imagine that it's going to be highly expanded and involve the closest packed tubes, but where just the tubes in the periphery were actually very low. So we're making measurements in single wall carbon nanotube ropes and trying to rationalize the mechanical response. Now, one reason why this perimeter model is sensible is that. If one uh, plots, uh, if one plots the um, cross-sectional area, so one would think that the product of E times A would either be proportional to the cross-sectional area or the diameter squared, uh, we get a better fit when we're plotting versus diameter, and that was compelling to us in terms of considering just the outermost ring of single wall carbon nanotubes whose participation would be proportional to the diameter uh, were very low. And so with that model, uh, we get Young's modulus values for those set of outer uh, single wall carbon nanotubes where the number would be fit based on the diameter measured with SEM of the bundle. That was fairly sensible with the exception of perhaps this one back in here. And again, the strengths were uh, lower than the expected value of 130. And um, it's possible that not all of the tubes were actually very low in the fracture. Okay, that's one of the most likely explanations about why we have lower, significantly lower numbers than 130. Because of course, for strength, uh, some of them might be more elongated than others, more highly strained. Uh, when the others are not really participating fully and very low. Or they might have been slightly defective, or there's some limitations to this model. And so um, I was very excited when Jim Cohn from Columbia contacted me and explained that they were now capable of depositing individual single wall carbon nanotubes and that we could do the same sorts of experiments. But we found that uh, those were actually very high quality. And I think the great challenge boundary conditions. I don't yet have a method, and I have worked in this area for the last four or five years because I've been distracted by gravity, but I don't have a method of configuring clamps if the nanotube is defect-free to cause failure to be occurring in the gauge length instead of at the ends. In terms of quadrionics, I'm actually two angstroms, perhaps a critical length for graphene or nanotubes. I don't think these structures are fault tolerant. And so they seem to fail at the clamps over and over and over. It was very frustrating for my team because the experiments are quite tedious to make measurements and even individual tubes. So as I mentioned, uh, we did end up measuring strains of order of five percent. So one way of explaining is, one way of explaining lower values than 130 is a model from Boris Jakobson that the stone whales reorganization, where you have two neighboring hexagons and one of the bonds will rotate, and you will nucleate a 5 7 defect pair. That's one possible rationalization for measurements of room temperature, uh, giving lower values of strength. In other words, you're actually triggering nucleation of defects that can then run through the material, through the nanotubes, collide with each other 
and build larger defects such as octagons and nonagons, and eventually you have a strong stress concentrator that can lower the apparent strength. So this is uh, the theoreticians visiting this issue. Uh, first, of the relatively low fracture strains. So Stephen Milkey um, collaborated with colleagues, and this is the set of strengths that we measured in that paper that we published in Science for multi-local The mean value, as you see, a little bit lower than 30, which would be A. And so what this team of theoreticians did is imagine that there were different types of defects, either removing one atom, or two atoms, or later we'll see six atoms, and perhaps more than six atoms, and seeing what sort of strength values you get compared to a pristine atom calculated under the same conditions. And as usual, we have this slight disconnect between experimental samples and what the theoreticians can model. So they're modeling very small diameter, very high curve nanotubes, such as a 5.5, so it's half the diameter of the classic 10. Which is one meter in diameter. So, and 10 zero. So they did a, a zigzag and an armchair taking, and they introduced either one atom or two atom defects in them. And then they looked at the failure stress uh, for the defect free tubes using that functional theory or these other methods that are outlined here, such as PM3, MTP, There's uh, other work by other authors such as Bogata. <coughs> and with those base values, they then look at the reduction in strengths uh, with these sorts of introduction of defects. So these are having these aligned stone wheel defects or one or two atom vacancies <coughs> present in them. So you can see that the one atom vacancy knocks down uh, by about 34 GPA. And two atom vacancies, um, you know, similar sorts of values. Rearranging two hexagons to have a pentagon and a heptagon drops the strength a bit, but not an enormous amount. So, in addition, what uh, Stephen did was to remove six carbon atoms, and he calls that the index zero case. And in this paper, they didn't try to relax the system completely because it would be perhaps too complex a calculation to do. In other words, the detailed chemical bonding after removing six carbons in the hexagon is probably beyond the capacity to calculate, at least at that time, about six years ago. And so they simply take that situation and begin to look at the mechanics by um, calculating uh, what the failure strain and strain would be. And then they uh, remove the next set of neighboring atoms and the next set and so on, create index 0, 1 through 6. And with those significantly sized holes, and I'll show you pictures of on the next publication, uh, you knock the strengths down into the range that we observed experimentally uh, in the paper that we published in 2000. So it's a conjecture that this oxidative etching was done by Andy Ritzler once we revisited with him and found out what he had done in detail to those multiple carbon nanotubes. With SEM, you can't really see the presence of these holes. It would be very challenging even to see with TEM. So it's really the mechanics that is elucidating the problem of presence. Because you're removing carbon, there's no reason why the outer shell of the multiple carbon nanotubes that survive is somehow sacrosanct compared to the other carbon. It's being hidden by the oxidative etching. <coughs> so this is simply showing the stress when you knock down the zero pristine values. Now the second issue that um, Stephen was very interested in and talking with me on a daily basis was why were the modules values so low? So perhaps we've rationalized the strength in terms of relatively large holes, but what about modulus values as low as 270 instead of around 100? So he then went on to assess what would happen uh, if we put in a very large number of holes, including some of those actually joining 
And what had been suggested, such as by Boris Jacobs and other talented theoreticians, was this path to failure that involved, again, a rotation of the bond joining two hexagons to create a pentagon and a pair. But it actually wouldn't lower the strengths enough. Uh, and also, at, at room temperature, uh, the expectation in terms of the kinetics was not matching uh, reality. Probably is not the right sort of mechanism. So in terms of modulus, if we really chew up the outer cylinder through this oxidative etching, we end up with, uh, of course, a marked reduction in strength. But we can finally begin to also influence the modulus dramatically. And so uh, they compare data from uh, PM3 type modeling with a mean field theory in terms of pitting density. Pitting density is just a fraction of atoms removed from the carbon nanotube. So the pitting density of 0.33, you remove one third of the carbon atoms. So you've really made it quite porous. And you can see that the modulus uh, you know, is markedly reduced. And you can drop down to values of 300 for relatively high pitting density. Let me now just visit, uh, just for fun, another topic because I don't know how many times I've heard that carbon nanotubes are the strongest material that ever exists. And I already mentioned to you yesterday that diamond along the 100 orientation is strong. And so I had challenged Don Brenner to address the issue of whether diamond nanorods, if we don't make them, would be perhaps stronger than carbon nanotubes. And I just want to sort of give you punchline I'll post my talk soon on the system website we can go through this in greater detail. But, um, by treating different orientations and uh, looking at the calculated strengths and comparing with ab initio, Don Renner uses um, classical potentials that he's fit to experimental data such as entropy of formation of time. Uh, it was possible to address this issue and what we found was only for extremely small diameter nanotubes were they rivaling the strength of the diamond nanorods. So very clearly, uh, the diamond nanorods were stronger uh, once you got to diameters above just a few nanometers. So I just wanted to show you a few other examples of use of the nanomanipulator. And I won't go into great detail on these because uh, they were quite challenging studies in terms of extracting meaning. But some of you might be aware of the role attributed to carbon black aggregates in rubber tires, for example. So it's perceived that uh, carbon black particles can join together and form snake like structures, and they actually influence the mechanics. That's one example of interest, and Sheldon Friedlander, who since he passed away, uh, was very interested in collaborating with us. He was in aerosol science at UCLA, and he had ways of generating aerosols that would lead to, lead to these nanoparticle chain aggregates. So the question was, with our nanomanipulator, could we approach these sorts of structures that actually are slightly fused through chemical bonding, and the same thing occurs with metal particles? that are made through aerosol approaches to end up with these sort of snake-like structures that we could then attach to our tip and pull on. And so we did the same sorts of experiments where we tried to untangle the nanochain uh, aggregates and pull on them and learn something about the mechanics. So I think that this is you know, kind of 